you remember a few weeks ago I preached a message on why I witness why I witness and I told you there'd be more to that message I just ran out of time that day actually I probably got a hundred hundred and one reasons why I witness but I won't give you all of them today I assure you but I guarantee you can't give me one reason why you shouldn't witness but I can give you a hundred and one reasons why you should right I should have got an amen on that but I preached a message on why I witness. And I gave you five things that day, five, or five reasons why I witness. None of them all inconclusive, and none of them in, in any particular order. They all have great importance. But I just want to remind you of those before I give you some more today. Uh, number one was, I witness because of the value of a soul. The value of a soul. Number two, I witness because the Lord needs me. And you can say that to yourself. The Lord needs you. The Lord needs me. Number three, I witness because the lost man needs me. And number four, I witness because there's a cry from above. It's God's cry for us to witness. And number five, I witness because there's a cry from beneath. And I use the example of the rich man crying in that place of torment, saying, please go witness to my five brethren. So those were five reasons I gave to you in the past. That's actually on TV, the YouTube. You can go back and look at that if you want to. But I want to give you some more reasons today. And what brought this to my attention was, if you notice, I think you will agree with me, I haven't preached any kind sort of message, necessarily a full message on witnessing in a long time here at Northside. I just haven't done that. It's not because it's not important, but I just haven't done that. But I just felt it was a need today, in the, a few weeks ago and today, to do that because here's why. Among many reasons, but here's why. I have never in my lifetime seen this world in such chaos. I've never seen it so twisted and bent on evil. Have, did you ever think you would see the day where if you spoke for truth and right, that you would be in danger of being censored? <laughs> I, I knew that day would probably come, but I didn't know it would come so quickly in my lifetime. Have you ever seen a day where if you speak truth and right, you're in danger of not only being censored, but you're in danger of being considered for a hate crime? We're on the cusp of that. It's happening. And we're on just on the cusp of it right now. And we're in such a time that I'm talking about not just speaking truth and right, but especially if you speak for the cause of Christ, you're in danger of losing your God-given right of freedom of speech. Do you remember what they said when they said to Peter, we threatened you, we warned you not to speak in the name of Jesus anymore. And what is, was Peter's response? We will obey, we ought to obey God rather than men. If ever there was a time to witness, y'all, it's now. Used to, when I used to work at a public job, at, at several public jobs, I'd always set my watch, what, Tim? Early. I always set my watch to get in early. I was always into work way before it's time to start work. I'm still that way today. I was here way earlier before you got here this morning. Way earlier. Way before the sun came up this morning. But I like to get to places early. Get, if the earlier you, you rise, if you can get in that habit, the more uh, it, your dreams are more apt to come true if you get up early. Your dreams are more, true to, more apt to come true. And also, you're more prepared for success. People that get up late, 10, 12, 1 o'clock, they don't prepare for success. <laughs> what, what? Did I say 13? <laughs> I'm thinking about military time down there at St. Mary's. Uh, oh, 1,200? <laughs> 1,800 hours? But no, early. I always set my clock early. And, but every once in a blue moon, as my mom would say, as we affectionately called her granny, every once in a blue moon, for some reason, my alarm clock wouldn't go off. And I'd wake up. I knew something was wrong. I'd look at my watch, and I only had like 15 or 20 minutes to get into work. Well, it no longer was time to get to work. It was high time to get to work. There's a big difference between time and high time. Well, I used to preach 
in a such a way that it's time to witness. But y'all, it's not time to witness now. It's high time. Because there's gonna, it's going to come, and it's rapidly coming upon us. You can see it right before your very eyes. It's going to come a time when it's going to be a lot more dangerous. There's a bigger price, heavier price to pay for witnessing. We better do it while we can now. Because it's going to come at a much steeper price later. You just watch. Remember I said that. But it's not time to witness. It's high time that we started witnessing. So, having said that, I want you to jump into the Word of God. I want to give you some reasons why I witness and why it's high time to witness. So turning your Bibles with me. I hope you have a Bible with you this morning. Turning your Bibles with me to the 19th chapter of the book of Luke. Luke 19 and verse 10. And I'll give you, I'm only going to go over two, maybe three reasons today, but probably two. Today. Being cloudy outside, I can't see that clock back there. And that's not a good thing for y'all if I don't see the clock. Just saying. Okay, so I'm going to use my little old phone here. Okay, Luke 19 verse 10, it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Here's a reason that I give why I witness. I witness because it's God's vision. I witness because it's God's vision. Have you ever heard somebody say, I sure wish I could see like God sees? You ever heard somebody say that? I wish I could see things like God sees them. Or you ever heard somebody say, I, w- I wish I knew what the will of God is. I've, ha- I've talked to people, they're just in such distress because they want to know what the will of God is. Well, i tell you one thing. You start seeing lost people like God sees them, you'll see what the will of God is for you real quick like. We need to have God's vision. We need to have God's sight. And it says, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see that word seek? Seek? Watch here. Look at me. God's got His mind on lost people. His thoughts are on lost people. His eyes are on lost people. His hands reach out to lost people. His feet, when He was here, He was... Going, marching to reach lost people. Think about it. Everywhere he went, he reached Nicodemus, didn't he? He saw Nicodemus. He reached Nicodemus. He saw that Samaritan woman, and he, he, she was in his sights. He said he must needs go through Samaria. That woman was in his sights. He reached Nicodemus. He reached the Samaritan woman. He even reached that little bitty guy named uh, Zacchaeus up in that tree. He saw him. In that tree, lost people are in God's sight. He loves them. He cares about them. And that's his vision. You say, I would like to see like God sees. Well, get your eyes on lost people and you'll start seeing a little bit like God sees. We need to see lost people in our day, in our time. We need to see them. But the problem is, here's the problem. A lot of time we're blind to lost people around us. We're totally blind. You, you, you don't, it's so tricky. You don't realize it sometimes. Here's how I know. A lot of times I can go into a restaurant. There'll be all kinds of people around me. The restaurant full. And I'll walk out not having witnessed to one person. I am eager to fill my belly. Boy, I don't forget that, do I? I, I feel it. But I don't feel the need of a lost person around me. How is it we can so, feel so present to feel the need of our belly And yet there's so many lost people around us, we don't feel the greatest need of their life to get them hooked up to Christ. Jesus, when he came, he had vision. He had 20-20 vision. He was looking, searching, seeking for lost people everywhere he went. But how is it we're not? We can go into a flea market surrounded by people and somehow it never crosses our mind that lost people are around us. We can go into a grocery store, walk in, got our list, get our stuff, get out, and yet there were so many opportunities to witness the lost people. Vision. Y'all, we need to get our vision right. If we don't get our vision right, you'll see. You'll see. You may not have time to get it right. Vision. We need vision. Christ had vision. He loved lost people. They were on his minds, and they were always in his sight. It says that's why he came. He came with a vision. And his vision to, was to reach lost people. What if his vision wasn't lost people? Guess what? Look around. All of us would be what? Lost, sunk. 
we'd be sunk. I'm glad he had a vision for lost people. But the question is, how do, we, how do I get this across to you? How do I make this real to you? How do you, I get, as Trent would say, do you pick up what I'm putting down? How do I get you to pick up what I'm putting down? How do you do this? How do you get people to see this? Because most people know that there's lost people around, but they never see lost people around them. How do you get them to see this? How do you have, get them to have the vision of Christ? Well, I was working, I used to work at a hospital, and I had a guy that I worked with that I loved dearly. His name was Al Fielding. And Al, I had never took the time to witness to him, but it was a burden on me. I, 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 one day I was like, I've never witnessed Al, and if Al dies, I, I don't know if I can bear me going to heaven and him not making it there. And so I witnessed Al, and Al was a rough dude. He was a rough character, older in age, very feeble-like, feeble. Uh, I heard when he was young he could run like swift as an antelope, but when he got older his health declined greatly. And he was one of our security officers there, and <laughs> you'd get to a job way before he did, but he'd finally get there when the, when the incident was about over. But... Al was just, a, he was just one of a kind. He was a neat fella, though. He was a neat fella. But I ended up leading him to the Lord. But I always wanted Al to have this vision to reach others. Not just to be content that he's going to heaven, but to reach others. And so I was like, how do I get him to understand this? And I, I would ask him every once in a while, Al, have you, ever, uh, have you ever, ever shared the gospel with anybody? Have you ever led somebody to Christ? He said, no, John. He said, John, John, I'm not like you. I, I'm not like that. I said, I ain't asking you to be like me. I'm asking you to just give the gospel to somebody. You can do that. Look, I notice most people. I know every one of you in here. Some of you are shyer, and some of you are not. Some of you are like Tim. He don't care. <laughs> I'm just kidding, Tim. But look, I know every one of you. I've seen you. No matter whether you're shy or very outgoing, I've seen every one of you talk. Something that we're good about. We're good at talking, aren't we? Think about it. Even if you're shy. I'm going to pick on Cheyenne. I saw her the other day in La Perea, and I saw Cheyenne just go, talking away. I'm like, there's shy Cheyenne talking away. But there's something that all we can, we can all do that talk. And so I was asking Al, I said, Al, I said, do you ever witness anybody? He says, no. So one day, we, one evening, I was working second shift, and we was out on the property doing a property check, right? It was dark outside. And we were in our vehicle, and we have to go make rounds through the property, make sure nobody's stealing, breaking in a car, or doing something they're not supposed to. And we were out riding, and I was thinking in the, in the vehicle, in the truck, as we was riding around, I was thinking, how can I make this real to Al? And Al always brought pictures of his uh, granddaughters. He had two granddaughters, one young and one a teenager. And he would always bring pictures of them down to the hospital and let us see, because they barrel raced. They had horses and they barrel raced. They were good at it. They would win trophies and medals and stuff. They were really good at barrel racing. And he, those granddaughters were his pride and his joy. And he would come bring them pictures. He'd say, I got something I want to show y'all. And he'd, he was, he'd be beaming from one end to the other, kind of like Gina and Tim do with their little grand boy. But he, he, would, they would, he would just be beaming. And so it hit me in the truck. I said, I know how to get it. I know how to get this where the rubber meets the road. I know how to get him to pick up what I'm putting down. I said, Al, here we were driving. He's dry, in the driver's seat. I'm in the passenger side. I said, Al, I said, do you love your granddaughters? Al had a very dry sense of humor. He looked at him. He wore glasses, and he'd always wear them down low, looking over his glasses. He looked over me like that. He said, what kind of question is that? I said, just answer the question, Al. He said, yeah, I love my granddaughters. I said, what if they went to a barrel race? and they came back and had a car accident, and they died. Would they go to heaven? Y'all, this is a real life story. He was driving the truck. We're not driving fast because we're in a parking lot. He's just moseying along. Al didn't do anything fast, by the way. <laughs> Low speed, high drag. <laughs> we talked about this morning. But he was just bumping along in that truck. But you know what he did? He, he immediately put the brakes on that truck came to a complete stop, and he just sat there still for just a few seconds. And then he looked at me, he says, John, John, 
He said, will you teach me how to give the gospel? He says, I don't want them not be in heaven with me. Now, Al was, I, we didn't really know it at that time. I already knew he was in bad health, but it wasn't long after that. His health declined very rapidly. And he never did get to tell his granddaughters how to have eternal life. But on his deathbed, he had just, they had just pronounced him dead in the hospital. He went on to be with the Lord, right? But his two granddaughters were sitting in the, another room. So I asked his wife, I said, can I go over there and share the gospel with those two granddaughters, y'all's two granddaughters? She said, yeah, and I led them to Christ. And as I walked out that hospital room from the hospital that day, I looked up and I said, Al, I know you didn't have time to get them, but I got them. I got them. You'll see them again one day. But see, the hardest thing for me to do is try to get it, make it real to people. Make it real to people. You're not a good leader if others aren't following. Now is not the time to witness. It's high time to witness. And we have to have the vision of Christ. We've got to see lost people around us. We need to. It's a need. He had a vision. But watch what his vision gave him. It says, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Vision gives mission. Vision gives mission. I heard a good quote this a few weeks ago. People are poor listeners, so say something memorable. You want something memorable today? Vision gives mission. Vision gives mission. He didn't just see these lost people. He wanted to do something about it. He wanted to reach them. He wanted to save them. He wants lost people saved. That's what he wants. But is that our desire? How much do we want lost people to be saved? Well, first you've got to see them. You've got to see them before you can reach them so that they can be saved. Vision always gives mission. But a lot of times we don't have the vision, therefore we don't have the mission. He had a vision and a mission to seek and to save that which was lost. Turn your Bibles with me to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. I want to show you what we can be like sometimes. Mark chapter 8 verse 22 it says, And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town, and when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. Okay, let's stop right there. So here's a blind man. A blind man, how much does a blind man see? Nothing. A blind man can't see anything. And here's why I relate this. When I read this passage of Scripture, I try to relate it to me, to my life. Oftentimes, I'm just like this blind man. I go places. I'm doing things. I got my own agenda. But I never see lost people around me. I get that way sometimes. I literally get that way. I don't see lost people around me. We can be just like this blind. We don't even see them at all. But watch here. Here's, maybe you're that kind of believer this morning. You just don't see lost people. They're just not on your radar. They're not in your vision. Therefore, you don't have that mission. That may be you. But watch what he did to this blind man. He spit on his eyes and put his hand upon him and asked him if he saw naught. At first he saw nothing. And then, in verse 24, And he looked up and he said, I see men as trees. I see men as trees. There's a comma there, walking. In other words, as he looked up and said, as he was walking, he said, I see trees. You know, a lot of times, watch this. Have you ever been going down the road, say maybe to work? You take... Most of the time you take the same what? Route. When I was going to St. Mary's, or certain, I'd take the same route every time. I just never deviated. It's just the same route over and over. Have you ever been going down the road? You've been going down that road, same road for years after years, and you see something, a building or something on the side, and, you, and it registered. I've never noticed that before. Have you ever done that? Out of all those years, you've been going by that building, and you never saw that building or whatever it is over there. Have you ever heard the phrase, you can't see the forest for the trees? You know, I think it's in reverse with us as far as reaching lost people. We can't see the trees for the forest. Look, there's 7.3 billion people in the world at the last count, over and counting, not adding, but multiplying. 
7.3. There, everywhere we go, there's people surrounding us. I remember what used to. I can go downtown Athens and get anywhere I wanted to. So easy. Try going now, at least when COVID's not around. Try going when it's everything is, everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing. Try do it now. We got people surrounding us all over the place, but we just don't see them. And when, and when the Lord put his hands upon him and spit upon his eyes, he said, how do you see men now? He said, as trees. We're not to see men as trees, y'all. They're not just objects. They're not just objects. They're souls for whom Christ died. I don't want to go out. I tell you a good prayer that you ought to pray. Anytime you go into a restaurant or a grocery store or anywhere where there's people, you ought to say, Lord, please help me not to be blind to lost people around me. Number one. Number two, Lord, please help me not to look at people as trees, as objects, as just objects, trees. Why is that important? I got to thinking about this. I go down the road sometimes, day after day, week after week, month after month, after month and I pass. How many trees do I pass? Jillions of them. Do I ever once? Do they ever? Do I ever even look at them, or are they cross my mind? Think about it. You go places. Do you ever think about a tree? Do you ever even look at them? I mean, they're just there. You know, they're there. They're out of sight, out of mind, right? We are not to treat people like trees. I know we do that going down the road. I got to thinking about it. I go down the road this morning. I didn't look at no tree. They're not. A tree's not on my mind. Farthest thing from my mind. We're not to treat people like trees, like objects. So, Lord, help me not to be blind to lost people around me. Number two, don't let me treat them like a tree, like an object. You know, I do that now when I go into a grocery store. I went into Kroger last night. Lord, don't let me, look, don't let me be blind to lost people. Don't let me see them as just some objects, trees, something that I pass by and don't give them a second thought. Mm -mm. But then look what it says. Verse 24, and he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. Verse 25, after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes. Why? Because he's still not got the right vision. He hasn't got the vision of God yet. Without his vision, you won't have his mission, I assure you. And after that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look what? Up. You know, the key to looking at lost people is looking up. Looking up. So many people nowadays have their heads down. Do you notice that? In screens, doing something, their heads down. you got to look up to see lost people around us. We need to look up. We need to lift up our eyes. We're going to see where the Lord says that to us again. Look up, look up, look up. Why? There's lost people all around you. Look up. Look up, and he was restored, and watch this. You ought to circle this in your Bible. Put a big underlined star, whatever you got to do. He looked up and he was restored and saw every man what? Clearly. He saw every man clearly. That's my prayer when I go places now. Lord, don't, help me, don't let me be blind to lost people around me. Don't let me see them as just an, like an object, like a tree. Lord, help me to see men clearly as I ought to see. Souls for whom you shed your blood. It's not time to witness y'all. It's time to see clearly. It's time to see lost people around us. The sands of time are running out. You know there's one thing we won't do in heaven? We will not witness to lost people in heaven because there will be no lost people there. If you're going to get it done, you better get it done now. What is it going to take to get believers to witness to people? I'm not trying to hit you over the head today. I'm just trying to get you to see the need. I'm trying to get you to see the need. Somebody reached me. And I'm so thankful. And people, you'd be surprised how many people think. I just went to Kroger last night. I was so jacked up about it, I called Sarah and, talk, Sarah and John and talked to both of them. I, I led a guy to the Lord named Randy. He was in the kids' aisle. I already know what to say. I said, hey, you must have kids. He said, yeah. He said, yeah. I said, what do you have? He said, I got a little girl. I asked him his age, 26. His name's Randy. I hope he's watching this morning. I invited him here, him and his wife and his little girl. But I ended up talking to Randy, and Randy was trusting in a list. I got you got to go to church. You got to keep the Ten Commandments. You got to live right. You got to do this. You got to do that to go to heaven. And I got to explain to him. He was just he reminded me of Cody a little bit with that big old beard he's got. He's got a big old beard, and but just such a humble guy. 
And I ended up talking to him, and he ended up leading to Christ. And I was so jacked up. You know, most people, he thanked me multiple times. He thanked me while I was there. He thanked me as I was leaving, and he thanked me as I got on down the aisle. He said, thank you again, man. He was so thankful. But we need to see men clearly, as we ought to see. Okay, I've hammered that point enough. So we need God's vision. That's why I witness, because I want to have God's vision. Number two, number two, another reason why I witness is because the fields are calling the fields are calling. Turn in your Bibles with me to Luke 10.2. Luke chapter 10, verse 2. The fields are calling. Luke 10.2 says, Therefore said he unto them, it's Christ and to his disciples, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. I want you to notice something about this verse. The problem is not with the harvest. The problem is, he didn't say the harvest is lacking, did he? No. You know this to be true. You go anywhere, there's people surrounding you everywhere. Even now in the country, it's getting more. I'm looking out, there's condos going up everywhere, all over the place. I'm like, I look down here at, by McDonald's, I said, Tim, what in the world are they doing down there? I thought they was putting in another Walmart. Nope, condos, ain't it? Some kind of places for people to live there. But the, it's, the problem is not with the harvest. No, not one of us in here are going to say, well, I just didn't have anybody to witness to, good Lord. I just didn't have anybody to witness to. No, and none of us can say that. Remember I told you I can give you 101 reasons why you should witness. You can't give me one reason why you shouldn't witness. And one reason that will never hold water with God, it will be a bag with holes in it, is I didn't have anybody to witness to. There's nothing wrong with the harvest. Here's the problem. The problem is, see that word but? The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. There's not enough workers. Not enough workers. Not enough workers. Have you ever been out on a job? Your workers didn't show up? And you needed them desperately? And the job didn't get done because the workers didn't show up? Y'all, this is not a pretty... If, it's, if this was a painting and we can look at it, it wouldn't be a pretty picture. It's an ugly picture right here. To have such a beautiful harvest that could easily be harvested. But the problem is the workers aren't showing up. When I worked in this big industrial plant, we would get maintenance calls. And sometimes the plant would be running good. And all, all the guys are talking and working together, and, or not working, but talking and stuff. Everything's running good. That's what you want. That's what you want. But then you get a maintenance call. Guess what happens to the, to the maintenance men? It's like turning on a light, <laughs> and what do the roaches do? Scatter. <laughs> and they disappear. I'm like, where did they go? Where did they all go? It's the same way. Where are all the workers? Where are they? The harvest is there, but no workers. Sad picture. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. Do you ever pray that prayer? The Lord said pray it. Do you ever pray it? Lord, would you send more workers? You know, we sung in that song, the Macedonian call. You know, there was a man in Macedonia. You know, you know that's exactly what he was praying for. Send somebody here to help. He said, send someone to help. I need workers. I need somebody to help get the gospel to this harvest. It's important. It's important. Turn in your Bibles with me to John chapter 4. John, I think it's, cha yes, chapter 4. John chapter 4. I witness because it's the vision of God. I witness because the fields are calling. The fields are calling. So watch here. John chapter 4. You know the story. You're familiar with it. The Samaritan woman. But watch here. Look at John 4 verse... Um, 35. Say not ye, John 4, 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months to harvest. Now I told you there's one problem. It's not with the harvest. It's with the lack of workers. But here's another problem. Say not ye, there are yet four months to harvest. And then cometh harvest. Here's another problem. Not enough workers and too many excuses. Y'all know this? Too many excuses. It's amazing to me 
how many excuses I can come up with not to go witnessing. Well, I got to do this, I got to take care of that, I got to take care of this. So many witnesses. And here's the problem too. We always think we got enough time. We always think there's plenty of time for me to witness to my family member. There's plenty of time to wait for, me, for me to witness to my friend. When I'm out witnessing, especially young people, I'll tell them, to, I'll ask them to do a couple of favors for me. Number one, read that heaven track that I gave them. Before they close their eyes, read that heaven track. Number two, I'll ask them who their best friend is. Hey, Joe, who's your best friend? Oh, it's Trey. Trey's my best friend. I say, Tra uh, jo uh, Joe, Joe, you know you're going to heaven now, right? Yeah, how sure are you? 100%. How do you know that? Because I trusted Christ. I done the one thing. They got it. I say, well, what if Trey is trusting in his works to get him to heaven? What if he thinks it's a reward he has to earn and work for? What if he's trusting in the wrong thing? He's not trusting in Christ. Will he make it? No, he won't make it. I said, what do you think you should do then, Joe? You, you, you see it sometimes. It lights up. Oh, I need to tell Trey. I said, will you? I'm going to tell Trey. Yeah, I, make, I don't make them. I, I leave them uncomfortable when I, when I leave them. I want them to go tell Trey. Because look, I often tell young people, when I die, I ask them, how old do you think I am? I'll, I'll, I ask them their age. Oh, I'm 17. And I always say, well, you want to swap places? They say, no. <laughs> uh, I say, what do you, how old do you think I am? Whoever says the youngest, I always say, I like you better. <laughs> anyway, but, but I always leave them thinking, hey, you need to talk, pass it on. Because I'll tell them when they stay my age, I'll say, look, after I lead them to the Lord, I'll say, I will probably die before you unless the rapture comes. I'm a lot older than you. Better looking, but a lot older. But I'm probably going to die before you. If I die before you, who am I going to be able to count on to pass this on? Is the flame going to die with me? Is the fire going to die with me? Is the message going to die with me? Who can I, who's going to carry it on? And a lot of times these young people say, I will. I will. Because I already got them telling their friend, right? It's important. We don't have a lot of time. When I was in high school, I, a good buddy of mine, Greg Barnett, I thought me and him would grow old together. I thought he'd be my buddy all my life. You know, he was in a souped-up Camaro with black Camaro, Tim, with white pinstripes down it. He, was, he had a, a car full of buddies showing off, 10 feet tall and bulletproof when you're a teenager. He went around that curve, and he died in that curve. Oh, he, you think he had a lot of time? He probably thought he had the rest of his life. I did too. I don't know if he ever trusted Christ. I don't know whether he's in heaven or torment. I don't know. But we don't have a lot of time. He says, lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes. Do you see that? Remember the other scripture? He says, look up. He says, lift up your eyes. Here's our problem. We don't have our eyes looking at the right place. Wrong vision, wrong mission. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. Look on the fields. You know, it would be good for everybody, everybody in here, just to go in a big parking lot where there's a lot of people and don't do anything. This is your only mission, is just to sit there in your car and watch people. Are you a people watcher? Any of you ever just do it, just to go out and sit and just watch people? It would do us good. It would do you good. But watch with this kind of vision in mind looking on the fields, looking at all the people and thinking this in your mind. If they don't trust Christ, where are they going to go? Where are they going to spend eternity? Y'all, this came real to me when I was 21. When I was 21 years old, talking about this looking on the fields, I was 21 years old. I had trusted, had trusted Christ. I had been saved 11 years. But I had never witnessed a one soul in 11 years. Because I was, I was all about me. It was all about John. But my dad would ask me, Time and time and time again. He said, John, go out, pass out tracks with me. Go out and pass out tracks. He'd ask me. I'd turn him down. Later on, he'd ask me, John, go pass out tracks with me. I'd turn him down again. If I turned him down once, I'd turn him down a hundred times. But one day, I finally went with him. I don't know why I did. Finally, I went with him. 
Maybe it was like that little widow woman in Luke chapter, whatever, it's 16 or 18, where she kept coming to the judge, pressing him and pressing him, persistent and persistent. He says, if I don't do what this lady asks, gonna, she's going to drive me crazy. Maybe that's the way I was with my dad. I probably just, if I don't do what he asks, he's going he's to drive me crazy with this. So I went down. We went to downtown Athens. Downtown Athens, where all the college, you meet every so, uh, type of person down there. You meet atheists, you meet liberals, you meet uh, vain philosophers, you meet all kinds of people down there. And we, I got out on the street, we got out on the street, on the sidewalk, and we started passing out tracts. And I watched them. And people, a lot of people would take them, some wouldn't take them. So I started handing out tracts, and people started taking them. And for the first time in my life, y'all, for the first time in my life as a saved young man, I had done what that verse said. I looked on the fields. I was watching all these people going by me, back and forth. Endless amount of people all day long. Endless amount of people. And I looked for the first time in my life. My eyes looked on the fields. And I came home when I was 21 years old. And I cried like a baby. Because for the first time in my life, I saw the fields. I saw the harvest. And I realized, no, I, I didn't know of another soul that was trying to reach them. I know their people were. But in my world, nobody was trying to reach them. And I, I cried. And I told the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't know how in the world you could use me. But if you can use me, I've seen the fields. I want to be worker in that field. Look on the fields. Look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. What does white mean? They're white already with, unto harvest. White means they're ready to pick. They are prime, ready to pick. Have you ever planted tomatoes? I like planting tomatoes. You know, you can have a tomato and it starts turning that reddish color. When it gets big, bright, and red, you know, you better pick that thing. You know why? Because it Georgia, it gets hot. In Georgia, you can have really rainy summers or you can have really dry summers. You, that, when you see that tomato red and ripe, you better pick it. You know why? Because it's high time. You don't have much time. It's going to spoil on the vine. It can't handle that summer heat long. It's going to spoil on that vine. There's been times I've been traveling and these, my tomatoes were ripe and I didn't get there and pick them in time. Because they only got a short window, y'all. It's only got a short window. I, I remember planting figs. I planted a bunch of figs this, this year because I like figs, man. I, can, I, I eat them so much, my belly gets like that. It just, I love them. They don't have time to make it to preserves. But I planted a bunch, so I had a lot this year. But we also have a tree right over here, a fig bush right over here. And I had so many at the house, I kept up eating all them. And I was starting on this tree, but I just couldn't keep up with it. And I hated to see them spoil. You know, figs are so good for you. They're healthy. They're like gold. It's like you don't have to go to Gold's Gym. You can just go to the fig tree. It's gold hanging on the vine right there. But you know, they were getting ripe. And so somebody in here can give witness to this. I called Miss Louise. You remember that, Miss Louise? I said, Miss Louise, would you? there's figs all over. I hate to see them go to waste. Would you go... Would you, if you want them, you can go get them. Because I just couldn't handle them all. I had something else going on. I couldn't get to those figs. Y'all, lost people are just like that. There's only a short window. There's only a little span of time that we can reach them. Only a little bit before they're white. They're white. They're ready to pick. But what a shame that you could get, you could have your hands in the harvest. You can have this harvest. You could have it. You can be a picker of the fruit, but you let it rot on the vine and it's too late. It perishes. The Lord said he's not willing that any should perish. All that was there for the picking, Randy last night, ripe on the vine, he was ready for the picking. It wasn't hard at all. Just I picked that fruit. I didn't save him. Don't get that. I'm not the savior. But you get what I'm, you pick up what I'm putting down. It's white. The fields are white already to harvest. But there's the problem, y'all. I laid it out as best as I could this morning for you. I'm not trying to beat anybody over the head with a hammer. I'm just trying to get you, get, 
Get what's beating in God's heart, beating in your heart. Get what's beating in God's heart, beating in your heart. I'm trying to do what I was trying to do with Al. Y'all, if we don't have a soul winning or fisher of men based ministry here, we'll never ever have the right vision or the right mission. We'll never have it as God intended it. So anyway, if you don't get it after I said all that, you just won't get it. But if you're here this morning and you've never have trusted Christ, you never have done that. If I was to ask you, how sure are you of going to heaven? Are you 0% sure, 50% sure, 90% sure? What would you honestly say? Could you honestly say you're 100% sure? If not, if not, I want to show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. This is the most important thing in the world. This is the mission, the vision of Christ. And this is the mission of Christ. He wants lost people, not just to see them, but for them to be saved. And he wants you to be saved today. And you can be. So I'm going to let this hand represent you and me and everybody in the world. That's us. I'm going to let this phone represent sin. You and me, sin. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That means we've all done wrong. We're all in the same boat. We are sinners. Now, God loves sinners. Remember, I told you they're in his thoughts. They're in his mind. If people even got mad with Christ because he sat down with publicans and sinners. They got mad at him, but he loves sinners. That means he loves you and he loves me. He loves sinners, but he does hate something. He hates our sin. Not us, just the wrong things we do. Now, I'm going to let this hand represent God. God's a lot different than me and you. He doesn't have any sin. Us, truckloads of sin. And our sin, yours and mine, separate us from a holy God. No matter how hard we try, we cannot get to God. He wants us to be connected to Him, but if we're honest, we're separated from Him. That's not good. That's bad. And since we've all sinned, we've got to pay a price tag for it. And it's one price tag. I showed Randy at the store over there. I said, see, what's on under every item over here? He says, price tags, bunches of price tags. I was like, yeah, but there's only one price tag for sin, and it's an ugly price tag. It's death. The wages or price tag for sin is death. All that means is we deserve to go to hell, be separated from God forever in a place called hell. That's two bad things, two bad things. But God loves us. He doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He wants us to go to heaven with Him. But to go to heaven with Him, we have to be perfect, as righteous as God. God doesn't have a good heaven or A-plus heaven. He's got a perfect heaven. Heaven's perfect. God's perfect. There's no sin in heaven. So it only makes sense that being good won't get us in. We have to be perfect. But you see the problem, right? None of us are perfect. None of us. We're all busted with sin. And no matter how many good deeds we do, it will never pay for sin. It'd be like going to the Dollar General across the store and you pick up a, a radio and you walk to the counter and you try to pay for that radio with monopoly money. Is anybody going to walk out with that radio? Why? Wrong payment. Wrong payment. The good deeds we do, like going to church, reading your Bible, praying, you name any good thing you want, is not the right payment for sin. It'll never, ever help pay for sin. It'll never pay for it because it's the wrong payment. It's death. The Bible says it's not of works. Eternal life is not of works. Now, I'm going to let this hand represent Jesus Christ. He's the Savior, and this is what he did. Jesus looked down from heaven. He saw us busted with sin. He knew we deserved to go to hell, but he loved us, he loved us, he loved us. He didn't want us to make that payment. So Jesus came down from his perfect heaven. He didn't have to die. He had no sin. We had the sin, but watch what he did. He hated our sin, but he loved us. So Jesus took all of our sins, big ones, little ones, hidden ones, secret ones, the sin that we never tell anybody else about. He took them all, past, present, future. He took them all, and he died for you and me on the cross. He'd rather die than live without you, and he'd rather die than live without me. He just didn't want us to go to hell to pay for it. And so he paid it all for us. And since he paid it all for us, we don't have anything left to pay. That's why the Bible says it's a gift. It's free. And he was buried, and he went back to heaven. He's in heaven today. He said, if you'll do one thing, you don't have to do it, but it's the only thing you can do to know you have eternal life, a home in heaven forever with God. If you'll believe that Jesus loves you that much, that he died and paid for all your sins, the instant you do that, God will give you, upon moment of belief, that free gift of everlasting life. 
Now you get connected to God. There is no barrier, no more, that can separate you from His perfect heaven. All your sins, have, that barrier has been taken away forever. And you can say, I have forgiveness of sins. You don't have to ask for forgiveness of sins. You get forgiveness of sins the moment you trust in Christ. How cool is that? As my granny would say, cool beans. Hey, you get everlasting life. And that means you can't ever lose it. Nobody can ever steal it away from you. That is awesome.